Um, very good singing tonight, another uh, very joyful and uh, jubilant singing, great songs again that remind us of the goodness and majesty of our God in heaven. And uh, this topic may seem unrelated to that, but really the theme is around that, of who God is and His goodness. And I told you last evening, if you were here, that we would talk more about brotherly love tonight. It's not necessarily our topic of brotherly love, but maybe an aspect uh, or a lane, if you will, in loving one another and loving our brethren. Now, uh, warning, there will be a tiny bit of repeat from Sunday night. It'll just be a small bit, but you may think we already talked about this. But where we scratch the surface of that on Sunday afternoon, we're going to expand on that this evening uh, in a sermon that I've, re- that I've entitled, Am I Required to Forgive? Am I Required to Forgive? And I want to start this uh, in Matthew chapter 18 in just a moment with a passage that Jesus Uh, where Jesus talked to his disciples about how to deal with when someone sins against us. We're going to start there, and we're going to move out from there, but there's something really important that we need to establish from those verses. So it may seem like we're taking a little bit of a detour, but we're not. Uh, But I want to talk about three different areas when we ask this question. Number one, why we must forgive. Number two, are there circumstances that warrant withholding forgiveness? And number three, finally, and probably most importantly, how is it that you and I as God's people cultivate a heart that is willing to forgive? And so let's go to Matthew 18 for a moment. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. These are familiar verses to us. He says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And then he says, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Now, the reason I wanted to start here is for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want to impress upon everyone here the seriousness of sinning against a brother. And God takes it so so seriously that he says, if someone sins against you, you go to them and you tell them what they did. And if they hear you, they receive you. He said, you've gained your brother. That is the goal of forgiveness, that is the goal of reconciliation, is to gain that valuable relationship back. But notice, he says, if they will not hear you, you take two or three witnesses that every word may be established. And if he doesn't hear them, you take him before the church, and the church knows him now as a heathen and a publican. It is such a serious thing when a brother sins against a brother that they could actually be withdrawn from, put outside of the fellowship of God's people. Now, why am I starting there? Because The rest of our sermon is going to sound like I'm sympathizing with the offender, and I'm not. So I want to start here by saying this is a serious thing when a brother offends another brother. But we're not going to focus on that tonight. What we're really primarily going to focus on is those of us who may have been offended. And so again, I'm not sympathizing with the offender. That's a problem. And it's a, it's a different subject, that we, and we're going to touch on some of that, but mostly we're going to talk about what is it that you and I are supposed to do when someone sins against us? What is our responsibility when someone offends us? And so I hope I, hope I made that clear, and I, I hope I didn't also just beat that to death. <laughs> Why are we required to forgive? Well, firstly, we're required to forgive because we are forgiven. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, which I believe we'll revisit later, he says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So we forgive, we're required to forgive because we're forgiven. Now, secondly, and related to this, we forgive so we will be forgiven. Matthew 6 and verse 14, Jesus said, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. We've talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ this week. We've talked about our responsibility to be devoted and committed to Jesus and following Jesus and keeping his his commandments and serving him faithfully and how all of that relates to our salvation. So does this. If you want to talk about conditions for being forgiven, conditions for God not not imputing sin to us on the day of judgment, this one right here is a big one. And it's not said just here, but multiple times that if we don't forgive... We will not be forgiven. James puts it this way in James 2. He says, for judgment 
is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. One of the reasons uh, why, I'm, why I wanted to look at the word mercy is because it's sometimes used interchangeably. And if we think about forgiveness, the purpose of forgiveness, it is an extension of mercy. But we often look at forgiveness as an extension of judgment and justice. And we're going to look at that in a little more detail here in a few moments. But notice that those who show no mercy will be shown no mercy. That's what God expects of his people, to be merciful, to be merciful people. Luke chapter 6. This may seem like a different way of approaching it, but we are required to forgive because we're a child of God. And this is exactly what Jesus teaches here in Luke chapter 6. And we're going to look at this and we're going to kind of break it down because it's all one seamless thought, really. It's all tied together. He says, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So notice again, we have this idea of kindness, of mercy, of, of, um, of forgiveness. Of not, being ju of not judging and not condemning. Now, let's think about this. And I want you to think about yourself for a moment. Do you have any enemies? You say, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I have any enemies. Well, if you have resentment and bitterness in your heart against someone, you absolutely have enemies. You do. Because that's the nature of bitterness and resentment. It changes the nature of our relationship when someone sin against, sins against us and we're unwilling to forgive them. We view them differently. And a lot of times what we do is we start building a monument. They sin against us once. They do something that offends us once. And we mark it down. We etch it in stone. And then when we see that person, next time we go, oh yeah, I forgot. Let me look at the monument. Oh yep, that's what you did. And that's how I'm going to treat you. And then they do something else. And we go, well, better write that down too and keep some notes. And pretty soon we got this giant monument of someone's offenses. And every time we see them, we define them by that. What if everyone did that to us? What if someone was keeping record of every bad thing that we did and every time that they saw us, they remembered every bad thing that we did and that they treated us in accordance with every bad thing we ever did? I don't want that, do you? Do we want God to do that? Who is God? Who is God? Now listen to what he says. Listen very closely. Because we sometimes think, well, I will forgive those people that deserve it. I will forgive those people that are living righteously. I will forgive those people who are morally pure. But notice what Jesus says. God is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Therefore, be like your father. Be like your father. That's hard, isn't it? It's really hard to show mercy to the people that we think don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. But he said, be like your father. That's who your father is. Your father is kind. Your father is merciful. Your father is long-suffering. Your father is forgiving. Be like him. So what is God's forgiveness like? Are there circumstances that warrant withholding forgiveness? Well, there are. And firstly, I want to talk about this in three different realms. And, and firstly, I want to talk about God because God withholds forgiveness at times. And God is able to do that. His justice is perfect. His judgment is his perfect. Every discernment that God makes uh, is perfectly just and judicial. It's always judicial. And, and when we think about God's anger, I think sometimes we think about God's anger being like our anger. And really, God's anger is not like our anger. And I'll tell you why. Because our anger is always fueled by emotion. And sometimes it lies to us. Sometimes it, it may tell us that something's wrong when something's not wrong. And, and maybe, maybe someone's done something and I get really offended or upset or angry about that and my feelings are not correct. But God's not like that. His anger is judicial because his discernment is perfect. And so when God views a situation and it angers him, it's a perfect anger. It's a righteous anger. And when God withholds justice, that's what it is. But you know what? My forgiveness is not going to acquit someone of their sins before God. I can't do that. If I forgive somebody, it's not going to mean God forgives them. That may not be the case. 
When we think about congregations, we see situations like 1 Corinthians 5 and also that we looked at in Matthew chapter 18 where a person may not repent and so the congregation is to withhold forgiveness, if you will, from that person until they repent. And what is the purpose of that? Is he trying to tell all the congregation as individuals to be bitter and resentful toward that person? No. He's getting the congregation to do something that will motivate that person so that it will restore them to repentance. And that's why he says, deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved. It's a logical withholding. It's not an emotional withholding. But ours is emotional. It's conscientious and it's emotional. And I want to ask you a question. What is the example or pattern that we have to tell us when to withhold forgiveness? And you say, well, I know a few. I know a few passages that tell us to withhold forgiveness. Be angry and do not sin. Now, how many of us have viewed this and said, see, Paul says, be angry. As though it's a suggestion. And that's really not his point. He's not suggesting that we're angry. He's not saying, be angry. What he's saying is, don't sin when you're angry. And we say, well, anger's helpful. Anger's helpful to resolve a situation. Well, anger is only helpful as an alarm. It's just like guilt. Guilt is helpful, but we don't want to hold on to it, do we? We don't want to hold on to guilt, but it's helpful. It's an alarm that goes off and says, something's not right. And that's what anger is. Anger's an alarm that says, something's not right. And so he says, be angry, but don't sin. And then he says... Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So he's not suggesting anger. In fact, he's saying when you're angry, don't let that anger cause you to sin. In fact, get rid of your anger quickly and don't give place to the devil. Now, how many of us today, if Satan knocked on our door, we look at through our ring doorbell or our Google Nest or whatever, and we see it's the devil himself. How many of you would open your door and say, Satan, good to see you. Come in, stay a while. Would you like something to drink? Have a guest room. No one would do that. That'd be crazy, right? But the truth is when we allow anger to dwell within our heart, that's exactly what we do. We invite him into play because when we're angry, it weakens our temperance. And sometimes we do things that we wouldn't have done if we hadn't have been so fueled by this violent emotion or passion that is in our mind. How many times have we stopped and looked back at a situation and said, man, I wouldn't have done that. If I wouldn't have been so angry, you'll let it get out of control. Yes, it can be helpful as an alarm, but not as something that you want to put a leash around and walk around like a pet and sick it on every person that annoys you. Anger is not really helpful, even though we often think that it can be very helpful to hold on to it. In fact, as we talked about Sunday uh, afternoon, in Colossians 3 and 8, he says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. We see the same in Ephesians chapter 4. What does Paul tell us to do with anger? He says, put it off. He doesn't say put it on. He says, put it off. And so that tells us what we're to do with anger, right? We're to set it aside. Is anybody going to argue we should put on wrath or put on malice or put on evil speaking, which is what the word blasphemy means, or filthy language? No. Why is it always anger? Because it's most common. It's most common. But notice the things that he says are solutions to the problem. They don't involve anger. They involve the opposite of anger. He says, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. It's not helpful. In fact, last passage about anger before we move on. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. And I, and I like the words that Solomon uses here when he uses the word rests. It's like it's sleeping within our inner man. It rests in the bosom of fools. It's made its abode there. And, and who's he talking about? People that are hot-tempered. You know what? These two things are related. We say they've got a quick fuse. You know why they got a quick fuse? Well, they, somebody says, well, they're probably just born that way. Well, that may not be the case. What may be the case is they've got a long history of unresolved anger, and it's resting in their heart, and it's ready to just attack at any moment. And a lot of times that's why we're wired hot. 
is because we haven't been dealing with our anger. And so every little thing that inconveniences us, we think is worthy of my righteous indignation. How do you know if your anger is righteous? We use that phrase a lot. It's righteous. So I'm holding on to it. <laughs> I'm keeping it. You can't tell me any different. Because what they did was wrong. Okay. Well, that's what Jesus was dealing with when somebody wrongs us, when they hurt us, when they sin against us. So what is forgiveness exactly? And I think there's a lot of misnomers about this. A lot, a lot of times we think forgiveness is when I'm able to forget what someone did. And, and where do we get that idea? Well, that's what God does, right? God forgets. In fact, he promised to forget. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, he says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. So God forgets the sins that we've committed. Does he? You know, we talked about David and Paul the other evening. We talked about David committing sin with Bathsheba. You know, that was written after David had committed his sin with Bathsheba. He inspired somebody to write that. You know why? Because God remembered that David committed adultery with Bathsheba and murdered her husband. He remembered those things even though Nathan the prophet told David, God has put away your sin, you shall not die. God remembers that Paul martyred Stephen. He knows, God, he knows that Paul did that. He remembers. God remembers. And that's not what he means by this, that God no longer has the ability to recall that. What it means is God promises not to hold that against someone. And that's what forgiveness is. Listen, when you think about forgiveness and you say, well, I can't seem to get my emotions to track with me when I'm trying to forgive. I can't change the way I feel about that person. That may be very true. You can't change the way you feel about that person. But the question's why. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness is a promise. Forgiveness is when I make a promise not to bring it up to the offender. I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. I'm not going to define you by it. I'm not going to bring it up to you. I'm not going to keep reminding you of it. I'm also not going to run around and tell everybody else about it. I'm not going to keep bringing it up to them. Why? Because I'm not holding that offense against you. And number three, when I do remember it, I'm not going to dwell on it or stew on it in my mind. Now, these are things we can do. We may not be able to change the way we feel about it, but we can make a promise to do these things. And you know what I've found in my life? If I'll promise to do these things and follow those promises and do these things, the feelings, they'll come along with it. See, God doesn't command us to do anything we're incapable of doing. God commands us to forgive. He commands us to forgive. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 21, here Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times times seven so regardless of, of whether this is 77 or 490 here's here's Peter's mindset this is what Peter's thinking there are circumstances that withhold that are that are that warrant holding uh, withholding forgiveness I'll get that out in a minute and they're all related to the number of sins and Jesus says no that's not the way it works his point is not, okay, Peter, 77 times you forgive, 78, thrash them. That's not his point. His point is there's not really a numerical limit. But see, Peter felt like there's got to be at some point, there's got to be a limit where I just say, I'm not forgiving you anymore. But Jesus doesn't stop there. What does Jesus say? He goes on to say there was a certain king which would reckon he would take account of his servants and when one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 talents he told him to pay but because he couldn't pay the king decided I'm gonna sell everything I'm gonna sell him his family everyone and payment will be made and this servant fell down at his feet and worshiped him saying have patience with me and I will pay thee all now, we would say it this way today. We would say, give me more time and I'll get your money. That's what he's saying. So let's think about this person, 10,000 talents. Now, I don't know exactly how much money that is. There's been estimates made about that. And 
And in silver, 262 million. In gold, 3.4 billion. I don't know what's in your bank account. My brain doesn't really compute. But maybe it makes it a little easier to understand what this is. Uh, these talents, they, they represent a certain uh, time period. And so, uh, best research I can find is that is about 160,000 years of day labor. 160,000 years of labor. Now, how many here have that much time? He said, give me more time and I'll pay you all. How? How? That is an enormous debt. Enormous. That's 58,400,000 days. We don't have that much time. What is Jesus' point? This man owed a debt he could not pay. And so what did this person do? What did this king do? After looking at this man who was on his knees begging him for more time, it says that he loosed him and he forgave the debt. That's verse 27. That's forgiveness. Well, how is that just? It's not. It's merciful. You can't pay the debt. I know you can't pay the debt. And because I have compassion on you, and that's what it says, he was moved with compassion toward him. He loosed him and forgave the debt. And that's our debt. Every one of us. We owe God a debt we could never, ever pay. Not with all the time in the world. We could never repay it. And then we find that this man goes out and finds a fellow servant which owes him a hundred pence, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I've estimated this both in gold and silver, somewhere between $451 and $5,821. Now, I look at that second debt and I go, well, that's pretty good debt. But not compared to up here, right? This is a debt that can be paid. A hundred days worth of labor, that can be paid. And what's interesting is when he approaches this person, it's like deja vu. Except for this man's cruel and he takes his fellow servant by the throat and he says, pay me what you owe. And this servant, fellow servant falls down on his face at his feet and says, give me more time and I'll pay you. And you'd think it, that, that the alarm bells would ring, right? That he would look at him and he would see himself and go, I'm so sorry, get up off the ground. <laughs> My mistake, you know what? I just had a huge debt that the king let that's the point of the parable. But we don't see that, do we? We don't see that from this person. In fact, we see quite the opposite. And it says, but that fellow servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Now listen, and he would not. It doesn't say he could not. It says he would not. He chose not to. And we look, we look at God and say, I'm trying to forgive. I would forgive if I could forgive. No. Not that we can't. It's just that we won't. We will not to forgive. And again, God does not command us to do things that we are incapable of doing. What about Luke 17, 3 and 4? Luke 17, verse 3, Take heed to yourselves if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he doesn't fully repent, you don't have to forgive him. You say, what version is that from? It's the one that I hear people quoting all the time. No, they don't quote it like this, but that's the explanation that they give of this verse. Well, Jesus said if that person doesn't truly or fully repent, I don't have to forgive them. So there are circumstances that warrant withholding of forgiveness. But you know what's interesting is we've taken this verse and we've applied it in the negative to say it's an excuse or a license to not forgive when really the teaching is teaching us to forgive. We're just abusing the passage for our own desire. First off, it doesn't say fully repent. It just says if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. But here's something else that's interesting. A lot of times we expect the person that's offended us offended us to repent without us ever going and telling them about the problem and rebuking them. We want them to obey God, but we ourselves are not willing to obey God by confronting them about it and telling them what they've done. And by confront, I don't mean go yell at them or get in their face or get aggressive. I just mean addressing the problem. 
But what is Jesus telling them to do? He's telling them to go and talk to them. That's the command, go talk to them. And if they repent, forgive them. But he doesn't stop there. He doesn't stop there. Look at verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Now, let's just do what we sometimes often like to do, which is be repentance inspectors. So let's be repentance inspectors here. Let's say that somebody comes to you seven times in a day. They sin against you seven times in a day. By about time three, I'm going, look, I know you said you're sorry the first two times and this time, but I'm, I don't believe you. I don't believe you're sorry. That's what I'm thinking, right? Because if somebody is really sinning against me seven times in a day, I'm thinking, you've got a vendetta against me or you're just a malevolent or wicked person. That's his point. Seven times in a day is not genuine repentance. If he says, I repent, you shall forgive him. You say, that's not fair. See, that's our problem. We think forgiveness is about fairness. We think it's about balancing the scale. We think it's about, well, if someone offended me, they need to do something before I should forgive them. And we want that scale to be balanced. We don't want to bear the burden. They're the one that did the wrong. I shouldn't have to bear the burden. Really. If we're going to cultivate a heart of forgiveness... The first thing we have to do is view ourselves through the lens of God's word, not through the lens of ourselves. And here's what I mean by that. And I've often used this analogy, and it may sound like a stream analogy, but uh, does your breath stink? You say, that's a strange question. This is what's interesting. Our mouth is this far from our nose, but we have to have somebody else tell us if our breath stinks. Isn't that weird? And my point is this, we're not as self-aware as we give ourselves credit. We really don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. And sometimes we have to have somebody else to tell us, hey, this is who you are. So take this with a grain of salt. Sometimes we view ourselves when we're offended in the wrong way. Matthew chapter 7 addresses this. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a, look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, we talked about this passage on Sunday morning. Jesus is dressing sight here. The ability to see things clearly and with resolution and see the definition of, of things. That way our judgment is correct. Now, here's his point. You need to be willing to judge the person you're judging the same way you judge yourself. you got to judge yourself the same way you're going to judge your offender. And a lot of times if we're honest, if we're judging ourselves by the same standard we're judging our offender, we're not going to be so upset and angry at them. Because see, when someone offends me, it has this tendency because they're so wrong that it makes me feel so much more right. It makes me feel more right that they're wrong. And the truth is, you don't become more right by someone being more wrong. And when someone offends you, listen, I know that we have elevated victimhood to the highest virtue of morality, but God doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. And so us crying out that we're the victim it really doesn't make us one iota better or more righteous. We have to understand that our offender and us are on the same plane in many ways, and we are not God. You say, well, that's very obvious. Thank you for that revelation. We're not God. We're not God. We're not the judge. We don't get to sit on a throne of righteous judgment and look at our offender and say, all right, I'm going to demand of you, and you will obey that's not how it works. Be very careful how you view yourself when you've been offended. And don't be deceived into thinking because you've been offended that that gives you the excuse to treat someone with un, without mercy and with cruelty. 
Matthew 18, 32, as we see the end of this parable in Matthew 18, it says, Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me, should you have not also had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you. Perspective matters. Y'all may want to edit some of this out. I don't know. Uh, my mother left when I was about five years old. And we were confused as kids. We didn't know why she left. We just knew she left. And we wanted to go live with my dad. And finally we were able to do that. And we lived with dad. And it finally came out. Dad told us why him and mom had gotten divorced and why she'd left. And I'm just going to be very frank with you. I hated that woman. I loved her. She's my mom. But I hated her. She would call me and I didn't want to talk to her. I did not want to talk to her. She would make excuses. I would think, I don't want to hear your excuses. I treated her terribly. I talked to her the way a child should not talk to their mother. And I felt righteous in doing it because I'm not the one that committed the wrong here. You were. I held on to that until I was in my mid-twenties. I tell you, I realized something that I hope we'll all realize and that that's when people offend us, it hurts us deeply, especially when it's people that we love, people we're close to. Those wounds are deep, aren't they? But the reality is this, no matter how bad they hurt you, it is nowhere close in the comparison of how bad you've hurt your God. That scale will never balance. And we can't try to make it balance. And when we truly understand how merciful and kind God has been to us, we will let go of those debts, not because it's been paid by the offender, but because sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ. And because my sin has been paid for by Jesus Christ, I forgive my offender. And we leave justice in the hands of Almighty God. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. You don't have the right for vengeance. Yeah, but you don't know what they... It doesn't matter what they did. We're not God. And we don't have that right. And number two, if we're going to cultivate a heart of forgiveness and mercy, here's something we must do. We must be willing to suffer wrong. You say, what do you mean by that? We must be willing to suffer wrong. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7. He says, now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat and you do these things to your brethren. You know, this is somewhat of a strange situation, especially living in the land of liberty because it seems like everybody sues everybody all the time and we just think, well, that's okay, that's justice. But think about what he's saying here. He's saying that brother goes against brother at law. You're suing each other. And he says, you're trying to cheat someone. You're trying to do wrong. He said, what you should be doing is just let yourself be cheated. Let yourself suffer wrong. Well, that's not fair. You're right, that's not fair. It's not about fair. It's about being like God. You say, well, how is that like God? 1 Peter chapter 2 says this, For to this were you called, now listen, because Christ, who is God, also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. Now we quote that a lot without context. And I'm not saying we shouldn't follow Jesus in every way, but listen to the context. We should follow Jesus in what way? Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. What is the example that Jesus set that he's telling us to follow? It was the example that he set on the cross when people were reviling him. When they were speaking evil against him. When he was suffering at the hands of evil man. And what did Jesus do? He said, Father, forgive. Father, forgive. This phrase right here, this is a very important phrase. A very important truth. He committed himself to him who judges righteously. What does that mean? Here's what I believe that he's saying. 
I'm not the judge. God, you're the judge. And I'm going to put that in your hands. And I'm going to trust that justice will be done. And sometimes I know when in my life I've struggled to forgive somebody because I've thought, well, if I just forgive that person, they're just going to continue to take advantage of me. Kind of sounds like the guy who sins against you seven times in a day, doesn't it? They're just going to continue to sin. We don't want to enable that behavior, right? Or we say, well, I don't want to forgive that person because if I forgive that person, if I forgive that person, that's not justice. And so they get away with it. Really, that's what we think. Listen, if a person deserves to be punished because of their sin against you, God will handle it on the day of judgment. Do you trust that? Do you trust God enough to say, God, I'm not going to worry about justice here. I'm going to put it in your hands. You do with it what you will. I trust that if he deserves punishment, he'll get punishment. And if he doesn't deserve punishment, you won't punish him and you'll give him mercy. Can we do that? That's what Jesus did. He said, Father, that's in your hands. That's in your hands. I'm committing that. I'm depositing it into your hands to do with it because you are the one who judges righteously. You know, when I think about repentance, I know that when I've thought about judging someone's repentance, I've always upped the ante. I've said, well, they said they were sorry, but they didn't cry. Well, they cried, but it was fake. Well, their tears were real, but it's not like they begged. Well, they begged, but they didn't come up before the church. Well, okay, they came up before the church, but, and it's always something else, right? And what do we want? That pound of flesh. You know why? Because we don't love mercy. We may have mercy, we may exhibit mercy, but there's a big difference in having mercy or showing mercy and loving mercy. This has been part of our minor prophet study this week from Micah chapter 6. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. You know what God does? God loves mercy. He doesn't just show mercy. He loves it. He loves mercy. Do we love mercy? You know, another story we looked at this week was the story of Jonah. And to give a little bit of context, Jonah was told to go cry against Nineveh. And if you don't know anything about Nineveh, Nineveh was a wicked city in a wicked nation. And Jonah didn't want to go. He didn't want to go cry against these people and, and give them the message of God. But he did. And when he did, this wicked city, including the king, they repented of their wickedness. And God showed them mercy. Isn't that beautiful? Now I'm thinking as a preacher... That's great. You go, you preach, people listen, they repent, God's merciful, amen, right? But not Jonah. Jonah's got a very different attitude about this. It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. What displeased Jonah? That God was merciful. Listen to verse 2. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Can you imagine being unhappy that God is long-suffering and gracious and merciful? Jonah was. You know why? Because these are the Ninevites. These are not Israelites. These are wicked people. And he said, this is why I didn't want to come here. Because I knew if I came here, I would tell them what you said. And, and they would repent and you'd forgive them. And we would never do anything like that, would we? Never. We'd never do anything like that. That seems so irrational to us. So irrational. But have you ever done that? I have. I've had someone not just sin against me, but sin against me and someone else at the same time. And the person that I was with was willing to forgive them and be merciful. And I was mad at that person for being merciful. Because I didn't think they deserved it. You know why? Because I didn't love mercy, and he did. Do we love mercy? You know, he asked Jonah a very simple question here. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? You talk about drama queen. <laughs> I'm so upset 
that I came here and preached this message and these people repented and you forgave them. Just kill me. And God asked him a simple question. Is it right for you to be angry? And I'm not using this in a general way saying it's never right to be angry. That's not my point. My point is he's asking Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about me being merciful? Is that okay? Do you remember the story, what happened? That it was really hot, kind of like it is in Houston. And this plant comes up and it covers Jonah in its shade and then the plant withers and dies and is eaten of worms. And Jonah gets angry about that. You know what he says? You'll weep and mourn over the plant, but you won't weep over the immortal souls of the men that were just saved because of my mercy. And behold, the real message that hits us right between the eyes, and that is, is that when somebody sins against me, it hurts me, hurts my feelings. It makes me very uncomfortable. And sometimes I value my comfort and my emotions more than I do their immortal soul, so I'm cruel and I hold them in captivity because I don't love mercy. Micah 7 and 18 says, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. As we close tonight, I want to go back to this time to Matthew 5. This is another account of what we read at the beginning. Where Jesus said this, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now I've heard people say this, and I've thought it myself, when someone approached me about forgiving someone, I've said to them, well I'm working on it. And and I hope you are. If you're really having trouble forgiving someone, I hope you're working on it. But I hope that that's not for you what it's been for me at some times, which really, when I say I'm working on it, means get off my back. And I want to ask you, if you've said that with your own voice or in your mind, I'm working on it, I want to ask you a question. How? What are you doing to work on that? And a lot of times what people have said was, well, I'm just waiting for my feelings to change. I'm waiting. Here's something Jesus gave us so that we can work on it. What did he say? Love them, bless them, do good to them, and pray for them. If you're working on forgiving your offender, are you doing these things right here? Loving them, blessing them, doing good for them, and praying for them. And when we say praying for them, What we don't mean is, God, please punish this person. I mean, pray for them. Pray for their good. Pray for their family. Pray for their soul. Pray for their heart. Pray for yourself also. That God will give you a heart of mercy to be like him. Therefore, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. I heard a story one time from another evangelist and he had been studying with the family for some time and the wife of this family had obeyed the gospel and he said, I developed a really good friendship with the husband and and he said he was a hard nut to crack. And he said, I kept going back over there and visiting with him and I would say, "Don't don't you believe in Jesus? He said, yes, I believe in Jesus. He said, don't you want to go obey the gospel? And he said, no. And he said, you know, sometimes I just go sit out in the car and just just wring my hands, just going, I don't know what's going on here. And he said, one day I went to the house, and, and I drove up, and I went in to see him, and he was gone. And his wife was there, and he said, well, I'll just come back later. She says, well, actually, while you're here, while he's gone, I want to talk to you. She said, I know that it's frustrating you that he will not obey the gospel. And she said, I want to tell you why. He said, I wish you would, because I'd, I'd just run out of answers. She said, well, you know, we had told you a few months ago that we've had some tragedy in your life. He said, yeah, I know. He said, I I remember you told me that your children had died. And she said, well, that's not the entire story. She said, our son-in-law, who was married to our daughter, killed our son. And not long after that, he killed our daughter. While she was holding their child, he shot her between the eyes. And he hates that man to the core of his soul. And he knows what the Bible says. God will not forgive him. If he doesn't forgive that man. And this evangelist said, I went out to the car and I sat in the car and I cried. 
He said, I didn't know what we were going to do. He said, but I went back in and I spoke to him when he got home. And I said, look, your wife told me what happened. He said, I want to encourage you to do something. He said, obey the gospel. Let God's forgiveness work on your heart. And he said, I didn't know whether that's the answer or not. But he said, he did. He eventually gave in and he went and he obeyed the gospel. And he said, then I got a call from him several months later. He said, I really need you to come to the house. And he said, okay, I'll be there in a minute. So he said, I drove over there. And he said, when I walked in, he handed me a piece of paper. And I looked at the piece of paper and I said, what is this? And he said, well, just read it. He said, I looked at it and he said it was a survey that they had sent out to all the people who were related to his son-in-law. It was a survey from the prison asking them about whether or not they thought he should be paroled. And he said, what'd you tell them? He said, well, I wrote in the letter that I didn't really think that the time he had served was really commensurate to the crime he committed and that he needed to serve more time. But he said, to tell you the truth, whatever they decide to do, that's in their hands. I gave that to the Lord. I gave that to the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, I've never forgotten that story, and I'll tell you why. Because it's not a story, it's real. It's real. And it's just like what God did. God looked down at the people that murdered his son. You know what he said? I forgive you. I forgive you. Who are we like? Are we like our Father which is in heaven? Or do we have a different Father? Do you know what Satan means? What the word devil means? It means accuser. And that's what Satan's called, the accuser of our brethren. Who are we more like? What are we more inclined to do? Show, to love mercy and show mercy? Or to judge and condemn and accuse? Because the truth is, we often look at our offender and say, you're going to do everything within your power before I forgive you. And meanwhile, God, on the cross of Jesus Christ, said, I am going to do everything within my power so I can forgive you. Friends, if you've never experienced the grace and mercy and forgiveness of our loving God, we want to help you do that tonight. If you're here tonight and you're a child of God and you've got bitterness and resentment in your heart, give that to the Lord. Give that to the Lord and begin to do the things that we've talked about tonight to cultivate a heart that loves mercy. And you know what I've found in my life is when I do the things that God has asked me to do, the feelings follow suit. The feelings follow suit. But you got to start somewhere. And the best place to start is by putting that, committing that into the hands of him who judges righteously. Tonight we offer the invitation of Jesus Christ. Please let us help you as we stand and we sing. Come have a seat on the front.